wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Fuad Kassab. Hello and welcome to A Quirky Journey. This is your host, Fuad Kassab, and with me is Joe Witten, my good friend who is freezing at the moment. I am. Hello, everybody. Um, I met Danny probably about 10 years ago on Twitter, <laughs> like I met you, for what? Yeah. <laughs> I think I met a lot of people on Twitter. Back then it was a, it was a big thing, Twitter. Um, it was really great to get to know her over the years because she's really interested in the same sorts of things as us, um, beautiful whole foods, real food, cooking from scratch, um, you know, just finding the stories behind food and um, celebrating community through meals and, you know, family and the love of food and sharing and all of that kind of thing is the kind of thing Danny's into as well. And we just love hanging out with Danny. Um, she's a food critic as well. Is that what you call her? Yeah, food writer. Um, food writer. Food writer. Food critic, yeah. Yeah, in um, Melbourne and travels the world with you know, her food writing and um, she has a beautiful um, website where you can go and find all sorts of videos and recipes and things. But she also has a, um, she'll explain it in the podcast, but she has a, a, like, it's kind of like an online cooking show that you can sign up and, and join and get it new videos. It is awesome. I yeah. love that. I love that program. It's amazing. She's got. It's the best. Um, such good really, quality. It's so professionally made. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, dannyvalent.com. You can go there. You can see her food writing and all, all there is to know about Danny. Well, you know, not all there is to know because she's <laughs> a, a deep well. But, you know, if you want to start to get getting to know Danny, you can do it there. And um, she's also the author of three cookbooks, mm -hmm. In the Mix 1 and 2, and Entertaining with Danny Valent. Is that the correct? I think the, that's right. The, that's right, yeah. yeah Which is also an awesome cookbook, all for the Thermomix. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes it super easy to cook all these recipes, and they're all delicious. And Joe and I contributed to the first two. Mm -hmm. I, I, I contributed to the second cookbook, and yeah. Joe did the first and second cookbook yeah. with Danny. And she's just one of the most awesome people I know, just so loving and open. Her eyes sparkle when she yeah. speaks with energy so and sparkly. love. And she's just, yeah, <laughs> I just love her, man. Yeah. Uh, she's one of the best people ever yeah. it was just so cool to be able to have her on the show we uh, sat in a deserted uh, food court uh, in Melbourne CBD and uh, just were able to chat for a good 45 minutes and mm -hmm. talk about her life which is a very interesting life she's done so many cool things in her life and she just I love the serendipity of it and how her attitude of how she got to, to where she is today just by doing what she felt she needed to do, and, and it's very yes. inspiring. Yeah, I think that mm -hmm. was her. That was her um, big tip: learn to say yes, figure it out That's, afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I always say too. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, we don't want to give away too much from no. the podcast. So uh, before we move on, Danny's running a, a competition Yay. to win a spot in her. Online program a membership. Do you for want to a talk? Year? Yeah, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so you can win a year's membership to the online program, and there's videos every week, cooking videos, and um, let me just have a quick look. So the competition runs until Friday the uh, the fifteenth, three p.m. So Danny's going to draw a winner at random when the entries close. And um, basically, the membership's valued at eighty nine dollars and offers access to over a hundred thermomix videos. Plus, a new video gets added every week. Um, and yeah, you'll find them really inspiring, and it it really helps to see someone cooking a dish because then you go, oh, oh, I didn't realize it was that easy, you know. Um, yeah. And and just the stories as well, and the the characters that she meets and interviews and has on her cooking show. It's, it's a really great show. So if you haven't checked it out yet, go and do it. And um, how do they enter? <laughs> so go to Danny's Facebook page. Oh, there it is. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, go to Danny's Facebook page. So Danny Valent. And we'll put the link in the notes as well. 
Um, but yeah, so the competition will be running from there for a week. Yeah. So I, I believe it'll finish uh, next Friday at 3 p.m. Uh, so we'll probably share a, it on our Facebook yeah. page too, so you'll find yeah, it we'll there share. as well. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Either our Facebook page or Danny's Facebook page. Do follow her because she's super interesting and yeah. uh, fun. And she produces really high quality content, way Beautiful. better than ours, really. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's so much more polished and professional. If you, you could just take her online program and make it into a TV show yeah. with no trouble at all. You know, it's so that well made. So you're getting a, a lot of um, great content from her. Highly recommend you check out her program. And, um, yeah, if you don't know Danny, definitely get to know her because yeah. uh, she's uh, life-changing, life-changing Danny. <laughs> <laughs> after after the uh, podcast finished, uh, Danny, uh, Joe and I went to, with a group of friends, moved to Miznon, an Israeli restaurant, and that was uh, super fun too. Yeah. So we added a clip at the end of the podcast for you to listen in to see what uh, that felt like and sounded like. So mm. join us for this uh, cool journey with Danny and uh, we'll chat to you guys next week. Hello, welcome to A Quirky Journey. It's your host, Danny Valent. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Danny! Hi, Joe. Hi, Fu. It's so good to be here with you, or I should say to have you here with me in my hometown of Melbourne. Up, up in, where are we? Uh, we're in a funny kind of bad retail precinct, <laughs> like level two. I was just trying to think of somewhere quiet. So we found a balcony near a food court. Um, it's look, it's not lovely, but I can see trams going by. I can hear like dirty little sparrows, um, and I can see a very tiny sliver of blue sky. So and we're going out for dinner after this, and we are going out for dinner to my new favorite restaurant. You can tell she's a writer, yeah, like yeah, the way yeah, she describes yeah. everything. Yeah, she's, she's, it is like a zombie apocalypse going on in this <laughs> little retail space. Like yeah. you feel like there's no one at all. Like the lights if are still on, happens, but there's no people. We'll be recording it. Yeah, that's it. There'll be evidence, whatever it is. Yeah. How long have you known Danny, Jo? Oh, goodness me. I think we met on Twitter probably nine or ten years ago now. Yeah, it must be it's something like that. Wow. You know, but it's, I don't know, you know when you know people and you feel like you've known them forever? forever that's, yeah. that's how I feel with both of you two. <laughs> Were you a Thermomixer back then? Yeah, I think we yeah, would have met yeah, through Thermomix, oh, okay, we would have right. Thermomix circles. Um, yeah. So shall I just introduce myself and say who do I am it, for people it. who really well, are just like, who to let is you know, she? We do, we do kind of do an introduction before the oh, podcast, you so okay. you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about you. All right, because right. I feel like but I do want to hear yeah. the story, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to say about so, me? Uh, we, we don't tell you that until okay. after. Only the worst things about you will be said, which are amazing. So so coming up, guys, we're really sorry that we've had to use Danny for this episode. I'm sorry. just had no one. Else, yeah, yeah there's no know. one else, and she just hijacked <laughs> us, and um, yeah, so apologies, just something own. like that. So, Danny, tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> no, okay. hold on, before before you do tell us about yourself, I just want to say that I've known you for many years now. You asked me to be a contributor for your second cookbook as well, which yeah, uh, in the mix too. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then from then, I think you came to Sydney a few times and went we to your met. restaurant. Yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you and, critique uh, it? No, I only just told everyone how great it was, uh, which is only thanks. the truth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So a, I think she came uh, just a few weeks after you, your visit or okay. before or something like that. Okay. It was just like within... Around the same yes, time. Yes, mm, yeah. Yeah. So, um, Danny, really happy to have you on the podcast. It's, uh, it's finally come to happen. Yeah. We've been talking about this for a yeah, while. Yeah, we keep meaning like, to get you on. Every time we say, when are we going to get Danny? We never do it. So She didn't actually hijack us. No. So, <laughs> Thank you. Danny, do tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, because uh, sure. maybe we'll start off with the, uh, you know, the food writer yeah, part yeah, sure. of you, well, and then that's we'll a move big, on to that. Yeah. yeah, it's a big part of me. So, okay. I guess I call myself a writer and an eater and a traveler <laughs> and a cook. So, I've been, I was born in Melbourne. Um, my parents are from Europe. Uh, my dad was born in Bratislava. Sorry, this is turning into a family no, history, no, but I'll be quick. Yeah, yeah. My dad was born in Slovakia. My dad's side of the family is Jewish. My mum's side of the family is English. And I guess from, it, from, the, from whenever I can remember, I always wanted to be a writer. And it was always about, I just loved words. I loved books. But I was also grew up in a family where food was really a central factor. You know, a beautiful Hungarian Jewish grandmother who was always, you know, desperate to feed us and then feed us some more. Um, and my mum was a really good, uh, I guess, meat and three veg cook. But then when my sister became vegetarian at the age of about <gasps> 10, my little sister, it really, I think, expanded 
all of our horizons about, you know, what you could sit around and eat. And my mum became a much more creative cook. And I guess she'd lived in Israel and with my dad when they'd first married. And I think she was pretty open to a lot of those beautiful Middle Eastern flavours. Yeah, and absolutely. And with, there's a lot of vegetarian stuff there. Absolutely. Just, so just that love of vegetables was there. And uh, so I think, I don't know, I just... You know, those classic things that you remember as a kid, you know, crumbing the schnitzels, cutting up the vegetables, making the cakes and licking the bowl, like all those things are at the sort of the core of um, what I feel like I grew up with, as well as the beautiful poppy seed strudels and all that sort of stuff that my grandmother would make. Um, but anyway, it was, it was writing that threaded through it. Yes? I was just going to say, we, we just did a cookbook with some Christmas recipes and we did the Hungarian, um, is it Bagley? Um, How do you say it? It's the poppy seed... Poppy seed twist? I don't know. I don't know. There could be lots of different names for it. Like, I don't know, a streusel. Or oh, I, was, a, I was waiting for you to give us the right I don't know. We had this dumpling. It's like a, it's a, like a scroll. sausage roll with a scroll inside and it. And then you cut them. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Like, it could be a babka. It could be a streusley. could be... They call it bagley, but I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Maybe you're vaguely right about the bagley. Vaguely, yeah. bagley. Uh, yeah. I have Hungarian <laughs> grandparents too. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I think, we, I, think I remember connecting yeah, yeah. with you over that. But you know what? I didn't come out of it speaking Hungarian. No, no. Um, Do you like <laughs> paprika though? Because Joe is like a sucker for paprika. That's all the Hungarian paprika. Yeah, that's all, yeah. I like, love that's it all she wants. Yeah. I love it. But you know yeah. what? I love all. I, I haven't really yet met a cuisine that I didn't like. Yes. Or a spice that I can't see a purpose for. Oh. Um, <laughs> anyway, wanted to be a writer. Uh, my first tra- my first writing job was in travel. So I used to write for Lonely Planet and went all around the world doing travel guides. And I would just go anywhere. So I wasn't an expert in some in a country, which was all, what a lot of their authors were. You know, they'd be the guy that spoke Mandarin or um, the person who, you know, knew everything about Argentina. I wasn't any of those people. I was just someone who would go anywhere. So they called me a parachutist. People like me were the parachutists who would just, like, drop in anywhere. How, so I, how old were you when you started doing all that? I was 26. Okay. How yeah. did you get that gig? Yeah. Uh, just random. You know... <laughs> I guess if there's a thread to to anything that I've done, it's just like just say yes to stuff and just put yourself. Yeah. And just I don't know if someone asks you to do something, they probably think you can do it, and they're probably right. Yeah. So I just done a bunch of weird stuff. Yeah. But the, I guess Lonely Planet was based in Melbourne. Um, it was a, probably the biggest, uh, apart from the newspapers, it was the biggest publisher publishing employer. And I just had a friend who worked there, and I thought that sounds like a cool place to work. Uh, so I just asked for a job and it was growing quickly. So I got a job um, in the sales department just sending out invoices to bookshops. But just over the corridor from me was um, the internet team. So that was when the internet was really just kicking off. And I was like, what's this, what's this internet thing? Um, <laughs> and I thought, I want to do that. So I just like, you know, quick, sneakily hopped over the corridor and started working on that. And then I was like, I want to travel. I mean, I'd always already been a bit of a traveler, but I was like, yeah, I want to do this. So... Yeah, just submitted a sample chapter and, you know, came back with red pen all over it and then did it again and eventually it was like, I don't know, we need someone to go to Broken Hill and that was my first gig. No way. All right, so Broken Hill, that was your first entry into into writing? Uh, Yeah, that was actually. And then, you know, next stop was Bulgaria. Broken Hill to Bulgaria. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) I love it. Caribbean, I mean, you know, the deep south of the US. Um, Ah. I mean, it was an amazing job, absolutely amazing. Uh, But the thing about... I guess travel guide writing is, you know, people say, oh, travel writing, oh, my goodness, I just see you sitting by the pool drinking cocktails. Like, actually what you're doing, (laughs) when you're doing guidebooks, especially at that budget end of the scale, like Lonely Planet, it's like what you're actually doing is climbing up five flights of stairs in 40-degree heat and peeling back the sheets and seeing if there are bed bug stains. Like, it's that glamorous. Wow. Um, You know, or you're at the bus station looking at bus timetables. And um, it's not that glamorous. And you're also moving really quickly. So you don't right? actually get to enjoy the sights as much? Or? You know, you just have to think about it in a different way. Okay, so, so you think about it as, I'm in the back blocks of Bulgaria. I would never have come here. Look what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm not, like, exploring every last corner of the museum. But I am having some amazing experiences. Yeah. But it's not travel as you might craft it for yourself just as a hobby or, you know, just not relaxation. <laughs> no, like the first time my now husband came with me on a trip, first and only time, I thought we were going to break up on the first day. <laughs> it was, we're in the south of France, should have been amazing, right? Of and he's, uh, he's like, I'm going to France with my girlfriend, she's a travel writer. <laughs> but um, after a morning, where I was, we went to, the, went to the beautiful, like Chagall Museum, I think it was, and I looked, checked where the toilets were, looked at the opening hours, got the admission prices, looked at one painting, I was like, babe, got to go. 
He's like, yeah, 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 what? (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) That would be frustrating. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, what do you, we just got here, like, but we've got all this other stuff to do. So we just had to, you know, have breakfast together, you know, go our own ways for the day, then meet up in the evening. And then we could, you know, then we didn't break up. That was, (laughs) that was what we had to do. So it's not travel as you might imagine it. But anyway, it led to food writing because one day my boss came to me and said, um, Danny, we need someone to go to Turkey to eat. I was like, I'm your man. Yeah, I, th- I think I can handle that. Check I, this mouth out. I've got, yeah, I've got, I've got like, all the equipment. equipment's right here. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So Lonely Planet started doing a series of guides to world cuisine. So Turkey was your first food writing year. Correct, oh. yeah. So That's why you love Manisa food so much. I, I don't know. That's well, why you like, I'm your best friend and everything. That's, <laughs> that's why. Middle East and... Yeah, it's, yeah, that's why exactly, I love yeah. you more than any other person in the world. <laughs> um, and it was amazing. So instead of, you know, looking, checking if the showers ran hot in the youth hostel, I was going down back alleyways looking for the yeah. best yogurt or the most oh, delicious better. chicken. Yeah. I was, sent, you know, talking to someone about the cheese and suddenly hearing a story about, you know, the, the grandfather that came with donkeys over the mountain. And, you know, it was just, you know, I mean, I, it's yeah. food is just at the heart of life and at the heart of culture and I think it was yeah skip the museums go get yeah, the yogurt yeah, I think that's right <laughs> I'm all and about the, the yogurt yeah. the stories story. and the emotion and I think yeah. look I don't need to tell you guys about this but um when you start talking to someone about what they eat and their traditions around it that is at the core of who they are mm. and it's a very um you know as a you know when I became a general journalist but as a journalist um what you're looking for is those ways to really get people to open up and to share their stories and share who they are in a way that's uh, easy for them and non-threatening. And when you start talking about, you know, what do you eat for birthdays or what did you eat for a kid or what does your grandmother make, then you really start to get to some big truths, but it's easy for people to talk about that stuff. It makes for beautiful writing as well. Like, so when you go and take that and turn it into an article... And you can do it successfully. It becomes something really beautiful. And something. One of the things that I really loved about you is the way that you write. Ooh, that's a motorcycle. Thanks for So, so your writing was really beautiful. And I, I remember reading an article that you wrote about a roomy restaurant in Melbourne uh-huh. about Joseph Abud when oh, he yeah. was just starting off. Yeah. And um, I was so impressed with your ability to see through all the detail and all the stuff that he was doing, which. To a person who, like, usually as a food writer in Australia, they're, they're quite vanilla. Usually they've, they've been vanilla. And then when I saw your writing, I saw it was just so spot on. And you, you put so much effort into understanding what the chef was doing and trying to put it with such transparency and um, honesty, I guess, to give them really the credit that they deserve for the, what they were doing. And you have this real ability to transform the story into words that just resonate with people. So did you develop that over the years or was it something that just came to you naturally? Uh, It's so nice of you to say all those things because it's really what I'm hoping to do is really, I guess, you want to honour someone's story and honour their skills and the heart that they put into what they do. And, um, yeah, I love doing that in the realm of food. Uh, How do you do that? I don't know. I mean, I think... Did you read a lot of other writers to get good at what you do or did you just develop your own style I don't know. It's really hard to say. It's not. This it hasn't been highly conscious, so it's not like I'm sitting there it's pretty much trying naturally. I mean, it, uh, yeah, but you. I don't know. It's like yeah, I like writing something and then reading it out and just hearing the rhythm and just if it makes me feel something. If I feel like I'm really telling, getting to someone's truth and honouring their story, then I guess I'm doing a good job. I do love words. You're you're a very good storyteller. Um, I know you sent me that article you wrote about Miznon, where we're going for dinner tonight, and I read that to three different people because ah. I just was like, oh, listen to this, listen to this, we're going here. This is, it made me really excited to go there because of the way you'd written about it. Right. And I had to read it to people. Because I'm, listen, listen, I'm so excited. And this, my friend wrote this. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, you know, I, I, it's a privilege. To, you know, I, I feel like, you know, when someone, when you put something in front of someone for them to read, that yeah. you're asking them to give you their time. Yes. And I think that is a bit, that's a lot to ask. 
Um, you're asking them to apply themselves to it and to think about it. And so I want to make it as um, pleasant as experienced as possible, I suppose, and the, just the rhythm that you use and that there is something of value in there. Someone might not ever go to that restaurant, but you still want them to learn something about the cuisine. To get the feel of it. Exactly, to get the feel of it. And somewhere like Mizan, um, where we're going... I mean, maybe we should just, like, record five minutes for when we, we get there. We totally it's, yeah. it's a, um, <laughs> it, Like, it is such an energetic force Vibrant. that I just want to do it justice. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. Writing's really fun. It's really, it can be really hard, uh, but it's a privilege to, you know, to try to do it. So, I don't know. I just I enjoy it. Let's keep going with, with your story because okay, you're sure. just starting to scratch the surface of where you've ended up. Like okay. I know where, where you are now and yeah. it's really even more amazing than where you, <laughs> well, you've just know. told us. So I yeah, It's amazing. But, yeah. So I was in Turkey chasing the yogurt, chasing the great chicken and the good <laughs> kebabs, um, uh, the, you know, the beautiful bread on the Black Sea coast and it was just so fun and it was a big topic to wrangle into a book. Um, And it was the first book that I'd written from scratch. So there's a travel guide. So I was doing bits and pieces. How long did it take? It must have been gigantic. I was in Turkey for a couple of months and then I was writing it for another couple of months. Right. And it was actually so fun because um, I was in Turkey, then I went to London and worked there for a while writing because I had people I could stay with. And then my next travel writing job was in New York. But I gave myself a month before I had to start my travel writing job to finish off the Turkey book. So I'd go every day to the amazing um, library in New York, Central Library, and just, I just felt so happy doing that. So good. Anyway, so when all that travel started to become a little bit... Tedious? Well, a little bit impractical uh, with the responsibilities and commitment of having a family, family. because I didn't break up with that guy in France. Yeah. <laughs> The, no, just like yeah, no, no one warned you not to have kids as a travel writer, food writer. No one said don't do it. Just keep with the, you have the best life. Just keep going. No, um, I don't know. Sometimes your body just shouts at you, and suddenly you got a big t- a bump in your belly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was on the food writing trail, and I'd started writing about restaurants here in Melbourne as well. So I guess I sort of segued. I still do travel writing, and I still patch, travel is still such a passion of mine. But I guess I've segued more into the food writing angle and doing it in different ways. So restaurant criticism, writing articles about chefs like the one you mentioned about Joseph at Rumi um, and the Miznon story that uh, you mentioned, Joe. Uh, and then it was through my journalism that I first encountered this little machine called a Thermomix. And this is probably 10 years ago mm. when one of my editors asked me to write a story about chefs and the machine that they wanted next in their professional kitchens. And they all said this word that I'd never heard before. It was Thermomix. Uh, and, you know, they tell you me what it did, you know, it chops, it cooks, it stirs, sorbets, yogurt, yeah, like, you know, um, hollandaise. They'd say all these things that it could do, and you're just like, no, it can't. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't happen. And as a diligent journalist, I thought, I've got to see what they're talking about. So I had a demo, and it was nothing to do with buying a Thermomix for myself. It was just about research for this story. But then... You ended up with- I ended up with one, yeah. It took me a while. It took me a couple of months of, you know, waking up at 1am and thinking about sorbet and, you know, all the things I was going to do while the risotto made itself. Um, but in the end, ended up with a Thermomix. So, and I loved it. I'm, I'm not really a gadget person. I don't have, I'm not a, I didn't have to clear away 10 appliances to fit the Thermomix in. I really just had, like, pots and pans. Um, and now I've got pots and pans and a Thermomix. And I loved it. I loved it from the beginning, but um, I wasn't satisfied with the recipes that were, were available at the time, and I certainly didn't love the cookbooks. This is back in the sort of spiral-bound days, days yeah, where... I started to. Yeah, and I'm a cookbookaholic. Just love beautiful cookbooks and love the inspiration that they can give you and, the, you know, the just, I don't know, the drool, the drool ability. Yes. Can we make up that word? That's a good word. Uh, so... I just kept waiting for someone to do a really beautiful Thermomix cookbook that I could have, you know, next to the bed to, you know, fall asleep with on my face when I um, went to, you know, went to bed. And um, no one did this book. And in the end, I just thought, I'm just going to have to do it myself. <laughs> Amazing. And not only did you do it once, you did it three times now? Yeah. <laughs> All right. But let's... I want to suck up a punishment. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, so 
the first one's called In the Mix. First one's called you... In the Mix, and the second one was, we, we racked our brains for a title and came up with In the Mix 2. Yeah, <laughs> the sequel. But, yeah. yeah, so Joe is a contributor. The Revenge of the Thermomix. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Joe is a contributor to both books, a very honoured contributor, and you're a contributor to In the Mix 2, which I'm also very grateful. Yeah, I'm only always only 50% as good as Joe. Oh. <laughs> she just hadn't discovered you yet. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, look, so... But, but it was such an interesting concept because um, and it's like so expresses your life, right? Because you've been in this food world, you are connected to all these chefs and people who are doing amazing things with food. So you take the Thermomix to them and you say, I want your best recipes for the Thermomix so we can create this cookbook. Yeah. And it's just a stellar cookbook now because it's got amazing chefs in it. Like, who are some of the chefs that are... <laughs> In, uh, in the mix. Um, so Massimo Batura is an Italian chef. Um, he's, you know, his restaurant's been named the best in the world, Osteria Francescana in Modena in Italy. Elena Arzac from Spain. Um, so also an amazing, from a, you know, three, third generation of this amazing restaurant family, you know, yeah. the mo- more Michelin stars than you, than you can imagine. Uh, yeah, so really great chefs like Jockey Petri, who's worked with Heston Blumenthal at the Fat Duck. Um, just really great talent and, I guess it's just, again, I don't know, I, I wanted to gather together these beautiful recipes. I wanted to put them in a beautiful form. And, um, yeah, I guess, again, it's a, a question of that element of trust that we talked about before where it's like people give you recipes to put into a book and you want to honour them with something beautiful. So try to make the photos as beautiful as possible, the design as gorgeous as possible, and just create that, um, just that inspirational volume of um, Thermomix recipes that I felt was missing out there. What's the third book called? The third book's called Entertaining, and that's a little bit different. So that came out 2017, and this is all my recipes. But this is where I feel like this third book, I've really brought it all together. So where the first two books have got about 70 contributors each, as well as a whole bunch of my own recipes, this third book, it's all my recipes, but I haven't invented them all. Like, a lot of them are regional classics. And what I really feel like I've done is... um, synthesize all my love of travel and my experience as a travel writer with my love of food and my connections with chefs and so what I've done is created a book it's got 13 menus themed by cuisine and occasion so we've got like Spanish or Chinese or Indian but then we've got fun things like ladies lunch or barbecue or party or Christmas so I guess the idea is to make it really easy achievable and joyful to entertain at home so you've got a Christmas menu all sorted now for... It's so It's sorted. there. Yeah. All right. So if you don't have the book, definitely you have to go get the book and use the Christmas menu because it's just coming up. Like, we've got a few weeks. You've got to do it now. You've got to do it now. I can, I can give you some more ideas for Christmas. All right. Let's hear, uh-huh. let's hear a bit more well, about Christmas. Oh, well, I, um, I suppose this brings me to my other project, which I've got going on, which is my website. Oh, yeah. DannyValent.com. And... Like, what? Like, why haven't you been on it yet? Yeah, I'm wondering. But I, I was on it before when it was Danny Vallon, the cooking website. So you sent me a, a login for that. No, and no, I no, 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 no. A video. Why haven't you come and cook? Ah, I haven't cooked. All right. I was, cause I, all right. Um, you haven't ne- you've never invited me, ever. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. But I did invite Joe, didn't I? Yeah. See? I'm just not good enough for you, then. No, no matter how hard it is, I try, you know. Like, but it's all right. It's okay. I don't mind. I, like, I'm happy to see, like, the stuff that you're doing because I remember when you first started the website and um, you started releasing videos and then you had this cheesecake ex- explosion that oh, sort yeah, of broke yeah, the internet yeah. for a while. And, <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I... Uh, the Basque cheesecake that I've put on there. Look, I suppose it really explains. Like, it's really all what the what the website's all about. So let's just just. Well, Joe, you haven't made that yet because it, it, you have to use a sugar alternative for it, and so you have to come up. Yeah, there are, but, there are but the, on the site there are like all kinds. Of, there's sugar free, oh, LCHF. Oh, no, no excuse. Yeah, there's all kinds of versions. Cake. You need the cheesecake, and then actually, I think when it came out, I wasn't having dairy yet. Okay, but now I can have it. There's a lactose free the... version, so oh, I yeah, have no excuse. But no, but just do do the cake. Like the only substitution I allow is a sugar substitution. But everything else you keep it the same. All right. But Danny, like, tell us the story of that cheesecake. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh. So, well, just to just to put it in context. So, DannyValent.com. It's um my. It's got everything on it. It's got my journalism. It's got uh, travel bits. It's got my like TV and radio appearances. But it, the core of it is. 
uh, Thermomix videos. So uh, there's more than 100 Thermomix recipes and videos and I'm adding content every week. Uh, so but this, and it's inspired, it's all kinds of inspiration for it. Some of them are recipes from my books, but some of them are recipes from my travels. And that's where the Basque cheesecake comes in. Because I went to San Sebastian right. in Spain, went into a pincho spa, which is like the little, you know, the Basque version of tapas. And this particular bar is famous for its cheesecake. I took one mouthful of this cheesecake and I realised why I was on this earth. <laughs> I was share this on this earth to share this recipe, to recreate this re- first to get the recipe because that was a challenge. So how did you do that? Uh, well, it was... <laughs> Bribery. Pretty. F- <laughs> so I was working through a translator. I was there making a video. I was working with it. You can see this. You can see um, the video on the website and you can see me in San Sebastian on the website as well. Um, I was working through a translator and it was basically I was thinking there's a lot of cheese in that area so we'd been the day before to this goat farm and seen the dairy and a special cheese and I was thinking there's got to be some really special cheese in this cake anyway I was like gotta find out the recipe can you ask them what they use in this cake? what's what's the cheese and, and the guy behind the bar is like feel a delphia <laughs> and I'm like what? Like, is that what Basque for like goat from the other side of the mountain? I'm like, so I get him to say it again. Philadelphia. Oh, that's so I'm like, Philadelphia? Are you serious? That's the secret ingredient. Cream cheese, it fixes everything anyway. Like, why would you be surprised? I love that stuff. Like, well, it's amazing. It, it totally works. And there are, other, there are some other ingredients. There's only five ingredients. It's the simplest cake. And I think that's why I need a support group for people who can't stop making it because it is so easy <laughs> it's and so delicious. Right. It's so delicious. So I guess, you know, it's such a thrill to develop recipes. And as a, you know, I suppose this is this idea where that's not a recipe that I've invented but I've you know love to share it and that's you've adapted it to the thermal mix as well which and that means it's never going to fail for people when they do it so that's that's awesome yeah that's right and it's just part of I mean I just get so much joy from seeing other people enjoy things that things that I put out there it's just what it's all about yeah I think from looking at your show um well, I call it a show because it's sort of when you watch the watch the program itself, you're looking at your videos and it's travel and it's fun. You're going to all these places, talking to interesting people. You get chefs from all over Australia, like mostly the, you've got the Australian chefs here yeah. for, the, there's for a, the. Yeah, there's a couple from Spain, one from Italy, and um, yeah, I'm brewing up a few other plans. And me at some point, hopefully, yeah. but. <laughs> All these really uh, cool and interesting people who are coming in with their recipes. And it's just really a lot of fun to watch. It's like watching a TV show, but it's quite educational, especially for Thermomix users, because it makes them use that Thermomix for something really, really cool, rather than just like, you know, the... Was yeah, what dreamy? What is it called? That stuff, uh, like sorbet, the, custard, yeah, the sor- yeah. and risotto. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, there's there are a lot of great recipes out there, and I think w- what I try to add to it is um, instructional videos that are made with a little bit of polish. Um, I, you know, I have lots of fun, as you say, and I love. I get great guests on. Yeah, soon, soon, including you. Um, <laughs> but I love to. I guess I'm always learning. Like with food, you just never stop learning. And I love sharing what I learn with um, my viewers. So, for example. I've got fun things coming up. Like I'm talking to a butcher and he's talking us through different cuts of meat. Oh, so awesome. lamb, pork that's and beef, like, you know, showing the shoulder and what would you use it for and why is it, oh, why would great. you use it for that? Got a potato guy, like a fruit and veg guy on there talking about all these different types of potatoes and another one with him doing onions. I'll have to share so, that one um, when we... when we can because we're always getting asked about what potatoes do we use for full hearts grain-free dough? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, you, you totally can uh, you share this video. Might be a good one to get for work. Oh uh, yeah! <laughs> to do the make you uh, dough. The dough. Oh, yeah, no, we can do the dough definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's would, a good idea. I would love to. Um, so I suppose I see it as like I love food. I love the stories that are around it, and I love all different cuisines. And I've got this great tool that's sort of next to me on the bench, which is a thermomix. But it's it's really about you know that excitement around food and the, and removing the fear around trying new things. 
Yeah, I think a lot of people when they uh, think about the thermics, I get a lot of people going like, ah, I, I like cooking, you know, and they yeah. say like, I don't want to stop cooking. Yeah. And the thermics takes none of that out of, oh my goodness, none no. of the joy out, really. It just makes it so easy. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, for me, um, I, I hear that as well. And um, let's get, let's just get it, this out of the way. I don't sell thermomix, so it's like, yeah, you know, neither do we. I would never tell anyone you like you got to have one like you can't live without it like no. yeah you can live really nicely without it but we have m- lived for millions of years <laughs> how about that um but for me it's really made me so much more creative it's allowed me to try so many more things and it's just this really handy friend in the kitchen that's really reliable and takes a lot of the um grunt out of some tasks but there is nothing in the contract um that says when you get a thermomix you need to like put your knives away that you need to yeah. take your saucepans directly to the op shop do not pass go like if you you want to stand there like lovingly dicing carrots which i sometimes do you are fully allowed to do that and your thermomix can be doing something else in the meantime yeah, that's cheesecake making cheesecake <laughs> that's right yeah if you want to stir your risotto like fine stir your risotto but on that other occasion when you've got you know 20 minutes before you need to get back out the door for soccer practice then like like just do it in the thermomix and okay. save your sanity give me some some of your favorite recipes from the program oh my goodness I'll talk about some of the stuff that I've got coming up. Um, I'm really excited about a Vietnamese-inspired lamb salad. So I marinate the salad in um, in pineapple and marinate the lamb in pineapple and coconut, and it comes out like this sort of satay sauce, but it's nut-free. Oh, wow. um, That's a good one. And we just steam the lamb, so it's just uh, and you just put it over just with a beautiful Asian salad with Asian herbs. So super flexible, but just with this coconut pineapple flavor coming through. We use that as a marinade, then we reduce it to make a dressing for the salad. Just, oh, so good. Um, I make aligo, which is, uh, sometimes you come across a classic recipe and you just think, I know this recipe is hundreds of years old, but it's like it was designed to be made in the thermomix. And aligo is one of those. So aligo is this French mashed potato that is... 50% 50% potato, 50% cheese. Oh, <laughs> that sounds good. Let's give the truck a second to okay. disappear. And we give the listeners a bit of time to recover from the idea of 50% cheese, cheese with potatoes, which yeah. would be amazing. And butter, tell me this butter. There is butter, and there's also creme fraiche. Oh. Are so, you... so it's like 20% potato. It's just 100% good is all you really need to know. This one. It's um, like if you, if you uh, Google Aligo or look at my video, like it's all about the cheese pull. So you know that thing in like awesome. food video yeah. land where it's just about stretchy, stretchy, yeah. stretchy, stretchy, stretchy. What kind of cheese do you use for that? So uh, traditionally you'd use Cantal or Gruyere, so French cheeses, but honestly you can use any melty cheeses. So for, um, for my one I use a mixture of Colby and mozzarella. Mm. But on, it's a uh, it's, potato, I mean you, you're into potatoes, the right potatoes, and I think potatoes sometimes you just look at as this really just the humble spud, like what's to say, but the, a beautiful potato has got such good flavor. Oh, like um, have you seen Francis Marmon in The Chef's Table? Have you seen that episode? Okay, so he's an amazing uh, Argentinian chef, and he actually gets asked to go to represent South America in some French or I don't know where, where, like some kind of really fancy kind of. No, I'm not. Yeah, maybe at the Bocuse door, and he goes and sets up. He gets all these potatoes. He smuggles them oh. into Europe, oh. and uh, <laughs> but they have like hundreds of different types of potatoes in there, and he just makes the most amazing potato degustation for everyone, oh, wow. and he ends up winning it. You know, the oh, whole really? thing. Yeah, yeah, incredible. <laughs> and he just throws the dirt on the on the white tablecloths and everything. You know, so it's an amazing episode. And that was like after I watched that, I was like, I thought I loved potatoes, but then I watched that episode. I'm like, oh. Oh, oh, potatoes are. And just think yeah. like you've got Aligo in your future. So oh, I you can't have wait. The, 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 Can we finish the podcast early? Because yeah, I, I'm just going to make yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, So I'm really excited about that. Uh, there's another classic dish, an Italian dish this time called Vitello Tonato. Oh, yes. So it's a, a poached veal dish with a tuna sauce, and it's just classic. And this one, so to make it, you poach... Veal with tuna sauce. I know, it sounds really weird, doesn't it? Yeah. I've, but it's, uh, it's yeah. like... You can find it in some restaurants around... 
uh, when I was reviewing for the Good Food Guide, I ate at a few different places. Yeah, yeah, classic like classic yeah. Italian yeah. dish, classic Italian sort of appetizer or starter, and it's the kind of dish that you can have sitting in the fridge for a couple of days, and the flavors are developing. Um, and so it's a really great one for parties, for entertaining. But again, it's like it was made for the Thermomix because you poach the veal in broth in the um, Thermomix and then you can use that broth as to, to make the sauce with Perfect. eggs and tuna. Awesome. It's just delicious, so nice, and just build it up with rocket and parmesan. So, yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, I, I, what else can I tell you? Like, I just, her eyes are just sparkling. She's so excited. <laughs> so, how, so how come you decided to make this program? So what's the... Um What's the idea behind it? Like, and, and what's the future of it? Is this something you're going to continue to build or are people going to pay to subscribe and then they'll just get these set number of videos? What's, what's the idea? Ah, so it's um, definitely something I'm going to keep building. So every week there's new content, there's new video, new recipe. Uh, and um, I guess the idea is, I mean, the motivation behind it is the fact that I can't be everywhere all the time. Yeah. You know how good it is to do cooking classes? Yeah. And you know how, you don't you love that transformation? Like people come in just maybe a little bit sceptical or maybe thinking, oh, I don't think I'd make that. And then, you know, by the end of it, they're just like writing their shopping lists Absolutely. and they're going home yeah, to cook. Yeah. Like how good is that? Yeah. And you just know people are going to just eat something yummy and they're going to feel proud and happy and excited. So I love that. I just love that. And... Uh, this website is this, you know, 24 seven solution to not being able to be in a room with everybody all the time at a cooking class. Yes. So it's just that that inspiration is there on tap. So whenever you want to try something new, you know, that you're always like plateauing with your cooking. You're like, Oh, I'm so bored of everything I make. <laughs> uh, it's like, well, just look there and there's a new recipe awesome. coming every week and, you know, a newsletter in your inbox as well. Um, great guests. And I suppose just, you know, that, that little bit of food education along the way. So new ingredients, um, uh, actually, also a lot of cocktails. Um, <laughs> I've heard that you've been doing that a bit lately. Mm. I saw that on Facebook. I did have some very rigorous um, cocktail testing. recipe <laughs> testing party recently um, where the minutes of the meeting became a little bit illegible as the you night needed, went like, on. needed a pharmacist to be able to read like what was going <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. Um, so, yeah, I'm definitely going to keep building it. And you, so you mentioned the subscription aspect. So there's... <clears throat> There's a bunch of free content, but to get everything, you've got to subscribe. Okay. Um, so I'm putting a lot of a lot into these videos, and um, so yeah, it's great to have people along with me for the for the journey Absolutely. as a member. Yeah. Uh, but I think we're gonna we, you, we're gonna give away a membership or two, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. We haven't worked out the details of the competition, but I think we'll, uh, when we've okay. got that figured out, we will put it in the introduction. Okay. And then we'll tell pe- people that how they can enter it, and okay. then we can put that at the end as well of the, yeah. of the podcast. So yeah, great. We don't have to stress it out now. We can just, just yeah. yeah, we'll work yeah. out the best way to the get it out to, to get some out. lovely yeah, people. Absolutely. But yeah, I'm really passionate about sharing um, the recipes and the videos, and it, like the win for me is that people are there creating those beautiful, happy moments with family and friends and creating those those memories and and going forward with um, more great dishes that they can add to their repertoire uh you know i mean we're so passionate about the joys of sitting around the table and eating things that are yummy and nourishing and fun to make and uh, you know it's a privilege to be part of that i honest honestly like when you hear that someone's made something that a recipe that you've given them like that is such an amazing vote of trust and I feel that really keenly, like I never take it for granted. And, um, yeah, I just feel so honoured and grateful to be part of that in someone's family, like then they put the food into their bodies, like it's so full on. Um, I just, yeah, absolutely, like yeah. 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 We feel the same because a lot of people will come to us and usually like they go up to Joe crying and they're like, <laughs> Joe, you've changed our lives. And then they'll come and like, Fuad, you've entered our home with your podcast. I'm like, awesome. Yeah. You know, like, it's just amazing. You know, they're crying. You know, yeah. it's just crazy. You know, like it's the, the nicest thing ever because you... You just think that you're doing something out there and maybe some people will hear, some won't. And then when someone does and it really resonates, you know that you're doing the right thing as well. Yeah. And you're reaching people. Because we're living now in an age where you know, people aren't taking responsibility for what they put in their mouth. And it means that they have to go to the shops or the supermarkets to get their food or restaurants all the time. And it's just getting scary because we're losing that skill. Yeah. And uh, we think that the most important thing for a family is to re-enable itself to in the art of cooking and the yeah. joy of cooking yeah. and the joy of eating as well. That's right. So, um, you know, it fits right in with what you're doing right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the thrill of 
produce and trying new ingredients mm. and, um, and opening yourself up to new cuisines. What are the barriers you think for people that you know from actually doing food? I think you know because so much of our food system at the moment is industrialized that it makes things mysterious. It takes the um, the, the sort of progression from paddock to plate. Um, away from people it becomes this hidden process yeah. and you feel like you aren't able to to do it you aren't able to um to be part of that process yourself because it happens in this you know closed environment and food comes out of a box or out of a packet and I think what I love doing is just sort of dismantling all that and um you know just reconnecting people with the source of the food and the different things that you can do with it and giving people freedom to experiment so and to taste. You know, this restaurant we're going to tonight, so guys, watch the um, video of Al Shani, the Israeli chef who owns Mizan where we're going. Watch the video of him making the hummus. Yeah, because I loved that. That was good. I watched that one. It's a really fun video. He's quite a character. <laughs> but the thing that I love about it is that it's about adjusting. So yeah. it's about building that confidence of tasting. Do you like it? Like, do you like do you like more parsley? Put in more parsley. Do you hate parsley? Then maybe put in some mint. It's that confidence to create food the way that you want to eat it. Mm. And from when you're using basic ingredients like the source ingredients, then you've got the freedom to do that, and you're just taking back that control. But it's like it's control that leads to freedom, and I think that's just a really beautiful thing. And what did he say, the chef say, about um, recipes that he doesn't really follow recipes? Um, yeah, he, te- he doesn't tell his chefs the recipe. He tells them the story, story of, of the, the dish. Food. I thought that was beautiful. Yeah. Right, that's pretty amazing because yeah. usually chefs are quite incapable of like yeah. <laughs> of doing any the recipe. recipe. Yeah. yeah. And He's, it's amazing. I'm so excited to go there with you. Um, so, but you know, then you know, you, so you've got this recipe with this chef and a video. But then I've had this great um, email from one of my subscribers recently, and she was she was saying. You know, I found the, t- the texture um, of the hummus, you know, I-, I thought it was a little bit thin, so I kept playing with it until I got it the way I wanted it. I was like, yes! Yeah, that's what you want like, to I want, I want that. Well, ingredients vary. It's not like when you go and buy chickpeas or potatoes or anything like that, that they're just going to come standard. Oh, like, it's, so there's not doesn't happen that way. Yeah, like even an ingredient like rice. You know, I was talking to a Japanese chef recently and he uses for his sushi rice a mixture of aged rice and young rice. Oh, now, rice... Wow. A rice as a living product is a concept that is quite alien to us here when you're just buying a kilo of rice. But rice, as it ages, um, becomes more dry. So it will need more water to get it to a fluffy consistency. You know, So you, if you even think that something as simple as rice has got all these variables, then you start to think, of course you can't just say in a recipe, one carrot, one tomato. Yeah, you know, exactly. Today's carrot isn't the same as tomorrow's carrot and your tomato might not be the same as my tomato. Uh, so it is, I guess, all about you know, giving people the confidence to engage with the actual thing that they're cooking with and you know, relate to it. Uh, and just, and create the dish to their own desires. Yeah, and not to be afraid to make mistakes early on and then try to adjust them and yeah. uh, move along because that's one of the big barriers for people is because they feel afraid that they're going to go and buy these ingredients and not be able to turn anything good out of them and they're, yeah. they're going to feel like a failure, you know, yeah. at the end of it and waste their money as well. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I guess that's where you always find that balance between giving people enough information to hopefully have a, have a success every time but to also give them the leeway to adjust things to their own tastes and to and to suit their ingredients. So it is a balance that you I guess you're always feeling your way through it. And I've learned so much over, you know, it's been ten years of recipe developing now and I've learned so much about how to craft recipes to give, increase the chances of people winning. So you want to say it's pretty close to foolproof. But um, in the end it's like it's a person in a kitchen with some food and Anything could happen. <laughs> <laughs> so we're coming up to the end of 2017, and I think maybe the best person to ask about what's coming in 2018 would be Danny. Like, have you seen any trends or anything like that emerging and things that are going to get popular next year? What do you think? I think, what are we going to see? You know, I think we're going to see a swing. This is maybe partly hopeful, but I think we're going to see a swing away from fear about some things. And, you know, if I think about perhaps, for example, salt, 
I think salt is one of those ingredients that people can be quite scared of. Mm. Um, but I think as people start using ingredients, cooking more from scratch, then people will perhaps start to realise, you know, that if you add some salt, it lets a lot of flavour out. You know, you can draw flavour out of ingredients. And the, the salt that you need to be scared of is the salt that's hidden in processed foods that you don't know about. So I think it's perhaps part of that, you know, that's one example of an overall more deeper engagement with um, with ingredients. And I think I'd, lo- I'd love to see that in restaurants. So you do see a lot of restaurants honouring ingredients. So it's just where we're going tonight, Mizanon, they, they would do a whole cauliflower. So it's just mm. the cauliflower. Or you might see a restaurant that's really honouring, you know, uh, honouring meat, so it might be not just meat that's thoughtlessly strewn around everywhere, but it's just like really honouring a piece of meat and knowing where it comes from and cooking it beautifully and just eating it as an event. So making it... I guess, so making the, the produce itself like the centrepiece rather than the idea of the dish. So yeah. like they create a dish around the, yeah, the ingredient it. itself. Yeah. yeah. And as far as new cuisines coming through, I'm really excited about Filipino. So I think that's something that we just don't see much of uh, you know, in Australia, we have so many different Asian cuisines that are all around the place, but Filipino is one that j- hasn't really come through as a sort of, you know, mainstream. There's no wave of Filipino cuisine as of yet. Is that, are you seeing it emerging? Yeah, you're just starting to see it wow, come through, okay. and it's sort of in, you know, student pockets, you know, little um, humble restaurants, but I feel like it's going to break through and become a cuisine that we see a lot more of and hear a lot more of. And start, you know, I love that progression where, you know, you see lots of Korean restaurants and then all of a sudden people are making kimchi at home. Like I'm waiting to see what happens with Filipino cuisine in that regard. Um, and then also more regional Chinese cuisine. So, you know, in Melbourne, as we're walking around, there's so many people from different parts of China. So it's not just um, not just Hong Kong or Shanghai or Beijing. It's like a lot of places um, uh, in the north. Northwest, for example, I think we're going to see more of those kinds of cuisines, which I'm really like so excited about. We're starting to see Asian influence coming into breakfast menus now, which is something yeah. that yeah we yeah. haven't seen for ever. Yeah, that's yeah. so true. I, yeah, um, there's this really cute cafe that I love in Carlton called Humble Ray, and they do a puffle waffle, which is a Hong Kong style waffle, <laughs> um, and it's just it's great. I love it. Um, yeah, no, there's some really really cool cafes, and I love seeing the Asian food coming to breakfast, like crab chili crab scrambled eggs and oh yum yeah, yeah so good <laughs> alright well Danny thank you so much for being here with us on the show really appreciate it um, so good to, to talk to you I'm glad I got you on my show first before you got me on your show so that I feel like you know you have to repay me the favor now yeah. so uh, <laughs> yeah I would, I would love to repay the favor and I do feel that it's a, it's a great honor to talk to your beautiful audience um, I love what you guys do I could talk to you for about a million hours about food and about eating we've got a few hours left in, in yeah, the day so we, we better get going I yeah. think we get some food into us so. All right, All right. let's do it All right. one big cauliflower <laughs> We record from the restaurant as well. When we get there, we'll do something there. Awesome. Well, we're here at Mizanon having an awesome time enjoying amazing food in a very crazy environment. Um, I'll have to, sh- I-, I definitely will have to post some photos on Instagram, so you guys better have a look at that. Is the video that you put on Instagram, will that stay there? Um, I can put it on Instagram. Put it on Instagram. Yeah, we'll put a video up because this is so much fun. Tell us a bit about it. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an Israeli street food restaurant, and the, the first one was in Tel Aviv uh, almost 10 years ago. There's one in Paris, there's one in Vienna, there's soon to be one in New York. Um, I was so excited when this place opened in Melbourne because I've been to the one in Paris. I guess what I love about it is that it's just, it's the loosest, craziest restaurant I've ever been to. Like, there's, there's barely any cutlery, there's barely any plates. Uh, it's just all about... Like We've been eating out of paper bags all throughout. Eating out of bags, you're passing sitting food on, around, sitting on bleachers. Yeah, so it's entirely communal, uh, just a little bit messy, I've and it's bringing more food. Oh. <laughs> and it's all about, it's just all about the ingredients. So I just love, yeah. Thank you. No pita. No pita for us, but the I'll re- eat the pita. Eat you the pita. Tell us what's like. So the, what's in there? Some lamb with tahini sauce, by the way. Yeah, tiny little oh. sort of meat. It's all delicious. Beef, I don't know. I just food. love the fact that here you've just got produce just lined up around the place, like cauliflower as decoration, and tomatoes. Yeah, yeah. and it's just. Cabbages. I think as we were talking about before, it's just about letting food be this joyful, kind of loose, spirited, communal, yeah. connected act. 
so joyful and exciting and fun and delicious, but nothing crazy complicated. It's very simple food. It is so simple. It is so simple. Like the only seasoning is salt and that's it. Like it is simple. Salt, pepper, butter. Yeah. That's it. Butter is the best way to eat. Like you yeah. put it on anything and then you've got a meal. It's that's all right. done. The more the merrier. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So anyway, thank you so much for like letting me be on your podcast and for coming to my town and letting me take you to this awesome place. I'm so glad to be here in the spirit of food and joy with you. Awesome. Love it. Thanks, Danny. So much fun. Thank you, Danny. Yeah, see you Thanks. <laughs> This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.